and we're live. Hello. I'm back. I took a week off. Uh, not for any dramatic reason, just basically because when I started doing these live streams every Tuesday night, it was with the expectation of like, oh, you know, I'll be working from home for probably like three or four months and that'll be great. That'll be like a nice little way to break up the week during quarantine. Um, and I, I had the realization last week, like, oh, it's going to be a lot longer than three or four months, probably. <laughs> and uh, also, I like if that's the case, I kind of need to like pace myself a little bit. So I don't think I'll do these every Tuesday anymore. But I'm still going to try to do this like two to three times a month. So like most Tuesdays, maybe is the way to think about it. So I'm back tonight. Uh, I do want to let my lovely viewers in the EU know that next week I'm going to go live, I think at like 12 p.m. Central, which would be like 6 p.m. London time. So because I've gotten several comments of like, you never go live when we can see you live. So next Tuesday will be in the middle of the day. If you're in the U.S. and on like lunch break, you can watch too. But that way, hopefully people in the EU can join live. Hello, 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 Michigan. We got the whole crew coming in here. Hey, guys. Um, so yeah, so I'm back this week and I thought that we could talk about e-reading, though I have to tell you guys, like my mind <laughs> has been, um, is not fully here because there's just been so much going on on YouTube today. And maybe we can talk about that if people are interested. Um, I'll do my best to refocus into a much more wholesome topic, which is my thoughts about, um, e-readers and e-reading. Hello, hello, hello. Got a good little crew coming in here. Okay, so I thought we could talk about like my history with e-reading, my thoughts about why I have a Kindle and like my thoughts about the Kindle. Uh, and then like e-readers versus iPad or like tablet kind of things. And then like generally like pros and cons of e-reading possibly. That's, that's kind of my thoughts of what we can talk about. Yes. The drama of it all. It's in the thing. It's like, it's drama, but it's also so about such serious things. <laughs> so it's like a lot. I don't know. Um, Okay, good. I'm glad people are... Oh, I love your avatar, by the way. But yeah, I'm glad people are excited. Uh, just, Zoe, just Google uh, search in YouTube um, Shane Dawson, and I'm sure things will come up. Uh, oh, okay. Welcome. Yeah. Whew. Okay, so maybe maybe I'll give, like, the Reader's Digest... Uh, version of my thoughts on the YouTube drama. Um, keeps my numbers up, but physical books are better. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about kind of my thoughts on different, like the value of e-reading for different types of reading, et cetera. Um, yeah. Ebook. Yeah. That's the thing. E-reading is definitely, I think, best if you have a dedicated e-reader, which I know not everybody has. So yeah. I agree. I agree. Hello from Sydney. Audiobooks. I also love audiobooks. And yeah, we can talk about that as, as kind of another version of e-reading. So there you go. Yes. Okay. We got a lot of love for, for Kindles here. Yes. Libraries, I think are the big, one of the big benefits of e-reading, especially during the pandemic. Um, okay. So my history with e-reading and my history with Kindle. So the reason that I have a Kindle as opposed to a different e-reader is basically because of like first mover kind of advantage and like a cl closed ecosystem. It's the same reason why I end up always getting iPhones whenever my phones die or why I have a Mac. Like I got tra locked into the Apple ecosystem at some point and like I'm loath to change. And I started getting e-books to read not on an e-reader to like read on, I think my computer, honestly, at the time, um, back probably in like 
2009 or 10 like i was early to the ebook game and i had ebooks at that point that were all for kindle or like were kindle files um so that is how i kind of landed on using a kindle because at the time i do think it was pretty much the best e-reader on the market at this point i've never tried a different one so i don't feel like i can really give a, a fair comparison between this and like a nook or a kobo or whatever really the only thing i can compare the kindle to is my like at reading on an ipad or a phone um but i've been using a kindle for a very long time what I will say is I think that the newer versions of the Kindles are much worse made than the original ones. The original ones were more expensive, but my first Kindle lasted me, I think, five years before it died. And now this is a paper wipe. Sometimes I've gotten a paper. This this time I got a paper wipe. Usually I've gotten like whatever the cheapest one is on Prime Day. And I'm lucky if these can. And granted, I am a power reader. I read a lot on my e-reader, but I'm lucky if these can make it through 18 months to two years for me. So I do think that they have gotten worse. Like the quality of them has deteriorated over deteriorated over time. That said, I still really enjoy having a dedicated e-reader and overall, I think for the price point, because at this point, these are not prohibitively expensive as they were when they first came out. Um, I do, for me, it is definitely still worth it to have an e-reader. Uh, let me catch up with some comments here. Yeah, and that that was another big reason why I really got into e-reading was because when I was moving around all the time, I also did not own a ton. Like, well, I owned a lot of physical books. I've always <laughs> compared probably to the average household, but I did not own nearly as many as I do now. I actually, BookTube kind of coincided with me finally allowing myself to go ham and pretty much have as many as many physical books as I wanted. Um, cause for a long time I was trying to not own as many physical books. L again, library is a big upside, I think for me. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah. I, it, I'm not sure if that's like the text or, cause I do find that on the Kindle, the, um, text really does simulate, I think pages pretty well at this point. Okay, cool. I've not tried that one. The books e-reader, but that's an alternative. Oh, hey, Jade. Hi. Bedtime bookworm. My my pal Jade. I love her. Um, she loves her Kindle Paperwhite. That's what I have. And I really enjoy mine, too. It's a good size, I think, as well. You can tell relative to my head. It's a pretty good size. Um, let's see here. Oop. Hey, Alice. Uh, yeah, I think phone there are circumstances where i do like reading on a phone we can talk about that but um oh interesting does kobo have like an integration with libby or overdrive i guess um yeah yeah i'm not always a fan of reading on my phone it, it kind of depends circumstantially Oh, okay. So Ashley's done the research. She has put in the time to do the research on which one is the best and your research seemed to say books. So, okay. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I do think that e-readers are a real uh, blessing for people who have uh, I or like seeing difficulties and need a larger font because large print books that are in physical form are very expensive. So I do think that e-reading can be really valuable for people with sight issues. Um, you can organize your ebooks on Kindle, but you have to stay on top of it. I, I can talk about that if you guys are interested in kind of how I organize ebooks. But I do think actually we'll get into this. One of the cons to ebooks and e-reading, in my opinion, is how easy it is to have far too many books <laughs> because they're so they so often go on sale or you can get them for cheaper for free. So um yeah, I do find Kindle really helpful for traveling. I very much agree with that. Um, okay, so it sounds like Kobo is directly integrated with Libby. Yeah, I tend to agree. I don't love reading on a, a backlit screen. I do. It doesn't really bother me, but after a while, I do experience some eye strain there. Um, 
Okay, that's interesting to know about sharing EPUB files. I, I, it, this is probably my bias. I don't love EPUB files. I find they're so rarely formatted very well. I don't know. Um, I do agree, though, that Kindle is much more restrictive. Um, and I know publishers would very much like it if everybody would move to EPUB as opposed to the Mobi file format. Um, okay, that's good to know. Somebody transferred from Paperwhite to Kobo and, and prefers Kobo. Uh, lots of love for Kobo. Okay, this is making me intrigued. Oh, I didn't know that that's who owned Kobo. See, all our, our evil corporate overlords, they're, they're everywhere. This is part of why I know some people really feel strongly against Kindle because of Amazon, which I can respect. I do feel like it's very hard to escape our evil corporate overlords. I mean, we're all on YouTube right now. Let's get real. <laughs> so I'm not trying to like t totally dismiss that. I guess I just feel like we are all making ethically compromised choices when it comes to like consumption. And this also gets into Zizek's whole like benevolent capitalism and how that's like a farce. And I just, this is one area I choose to have a little bit of nihilism and say like, <laughs> it's impossible to escape it. So I'm, I'm not gonna, I have so many other things I can feel bad about. This is just one I'm not gonna spend energy on. Yeah, I could see that. I think some people struggle with e-reading. Um, see, I will say, um, I'm glad you find it easy for studying. That is actually one thing I really didn't like my Kindle for when I was in grad school. I tried to do some e-reading and take notes, and I actually found I personally, when I'm studying, very much prefer a physical book, um, or at least if I'm going to read on an e-reader or read e-books for studying, I have to take notes separately from that device or else I don't retain as much. Ooh, okay. Well, hey, enjoy that, Alice. I think you will like it. Um, oh, that does suck, Derek. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. It is very helpful for sight issues, the same way audiobooks are very helpful for people who have sight issues as well. Uh, Kindle Fire, there we go. Um, <laughs> okay, I feel this so hard, not the specifically cracking the spines bit or like messing up the physical bit, but sometimes, and maybe this is where I'll briefly segue into kind of how I do e-reading. So like e-reading for me, I tend to think of in the same capacity as I think of mass markets. So like in terms of buying books, if it's a book that I would have before e-readers were a thing or e-books were a thing, um, before that time, if I would have gotten a mass market paperback, that is to me the kind of mindset with which I approach an ebook. So I tend to really like ebooks for very like fun reading. I do, I'm not going to say I, I, I definitely have read bigger books through an e-reader or like more serious books or whatever through an e-reader. It's not that it's impossible for me to do it, but in my mind, e-reading is for a specific kind of reading. And I don't know what that says about me, but that's just like kind of how I think about it. I think that's also maybe why I struggled to study with ebooks or like process more heavy information with ebooks. Um, I personally preferred a physical one. So all that to say, yes, there have been situations where I have an e-copy and a physical cop or like a physical copy, but then I end up reading it through an e-copy or an audiobook sometimes, just based on the kind of reading mood I was in. So there we go. Um, oh, thank you, Denise. Yeah. Cloud yeah, Hoopla is another good service that I've used. I've not tried Cloud Library. Um yeah, I'm also in that Apple ecosystem. It's just, it's hard. Once you get locked into one, it's really hard to get out. I, Sarah, I will agree. That's the other thing. I do find that I read a lot faster on Kindle. And, and again, I think that probably goes into why I tend to want to read lighter things on Kindle or on my e-reader. Um, because just like the mindset I have is not as like deep of reading. It's more like fun reading. Um, yeah. Let's see here. <laughs> I can't bring myself to crack my spines because I was such a big used book store user as a kid. And I, we would always take the books back that I'd read and you can get more for them if they're in better condition. So it's like so ingrained in me to like take care of the books because it's going to go back to the used bookstore at some point. Um, listening to... 
uh, I'm not sure that I've not, I don't really listen to um, ebooks. I know that if you have Kindle Unlimited, that is one of the benefits is if there's an audio version of a book that you are reading on Kindle Unlimited, you can get the audible, audible version for, for free through it as a part of that. Yeah, yeah, I just tend to read a lot faster and kind of lighter on an e-reader. Yes, I think that e-reading, the number of one like case for an e-reader is if you travel quite a bit or if you commute and want to read because it is so convenient being able to read to have multiple books with you at once. Yeah, that that it sounds like there's a lot of us who have a similar similar approach in terms of the types of books we read on e-reader. We've got a lot of cr uh, a split here for who cracks their spines and who doesn't. Um, okay, there's some audio recommendations. No, I've only ever been recognized from YouTube once and it was like such a lovely interaction. It was my local bookstore. See, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, that's, it seems like we're getting a consensus here. Um, oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah. So it seems like a lot of people are having, uh, having a, uh, a similar experience then. Um, let's see here. Uh, yes, that's the, okay. Yeah. That's the other use case I wanted to mention for what I really like about e-reading. Um, romance readers were some of the first adopters of ebooks because their covers are, are such a like touch point for people judging them and judging what they're reading, uh, that they were early adopters because it does allow you to read publicly without like, honestly, I have had like physical romance books out in the wild before. And like, it's, it's not uncommon for people to like, um, I mean, harass might be too strong, but like, like men make inappropriate jokes to you or like people like kind of make a joke about you. It's just not great. So, um, yeah, I just, it's not my favorite. So I think that having romance, uh, the ability to read romance on the go is, is definitely good. Um, yeah. Yes. Okay. Here's another thing I wanted to bring up. Technically, when you buy an ebook, you are actually really only permanently leasing it from the seller. So I am very much of that same mind. I, if I have to pay more than about five, yeah, I think five bucks is about Eh, the same as a mass market paperback, basically. If I have to pay more than a mass market paperback for an e for a, a ebook, I will not pay that. I will just get the physical book, or I'll wait for it from the library. That's kind of my um, bottom line there. So I know people complain about how expensive ebooks are. I will say for new releases, it is a part of how publishers are making their overhead back and how they're paying out the author's advance. So like, I get it. It is frustrating how expensive eBooks are on at, like when they first are released. And I do think some of them are far too expensive. Like I've seen eBooks that are on sale for like $14.99, like please. But I do think like $7.99, while that's the most I would ever pay for an eBook, I do understand that pricing point for a new one because of some of those like structural costs that are part of it. I've heard, ooh, I've heard that um, Born a Crime is, is a really great book. Um, there you go. Yeah, I think, well, also, I think that there's been some research done too, just that the kind of reading you do on screens we're trained to do that a little bit differently. Like we take in information differently from our screens than we do from physical pages. Um, this gets into some of the like McClellan's, like the medium is the message stuff. But I was actually listening to a podcast today about deep reading. And there, there is some interesting science behind like how we process, like how the medium through which we ingest something um, does impact the experience of reading itself. Um, <laughs> I like to write in books where I'm like really trying to absorb the information, um, but I don't do it just willy nilly normally. 
yes, people hassle hassle romance readers. Um, I preferred Virginia Woolf to James Joyce, but I I I'm always loath to talk about better or worse in these things because I think a lot of it's just a matter of preference. Um. I don't know about that, but that's a good question about Libra FM being integrated with any e-readers. It's definitely, I don't think it is with Kendall, but it could be with Kobo. Yes. Okay. This is, I'm going to have a different live stream where we, where I go into detail about how I get deals on, e on books in general, but this is a great tip for, for eBooks is like, if you're not, if you don't have to read it right then, if you could be patient, most eBooks will eventually go on sale much more so than physical books. Oh man, I, yeah, I would not pay that much for an ebook. Whoop whoop! Welcome to BookTube. Um, there's a question about Divergent, which I haven't read. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. I'm listening to the stream while working. So I'm trying to keep up with what you're saying and guessing the comments shown, but I'm really happy to find more people talking about e-reading. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm not reading as many of these comments because I'm trying to, I'm trying to get better about keeping up with chat these days. Um, okay. Phobo says that they actually feel like they read faster in a physical book. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I'm sure that there's variation from person to person. Um, Yes, that, okay, Edith points out that you can get uh, books that are in the public domain for free on, e like, as ebooks, which I think is really uh, a great um, benefit of e-reading. Um, do you prefer hardbacks or paperbacks and why? Also, what do you think about dog-earing pages and writing, highlighting in books? Um, I personally prefer hardbacks because hardbacks, uh, while not as well made as they used to be and therefore will not last as long as some of the books of your have lasted. <laughs> um, they do last much longer than paperbacks. And if I'm going to have a book in physical form, I would prefer to have a book that has some longevity to it in terms of its physical form. Um, I also, I think some people really struggle reading hardbacks and like they don't like the experience of reading a hardback physically, but because I am somebody who doesn't like crack spines, for example, um, I don't struggle with that. I actually, I read, I know this is controversial. I read my hardbacks with the covers on. Crazy. Um, so personally, I prefer hardbacks if they're not available and the paperback is the same price or cheaper in some cases than the, the ebook of version, then I will get a paperback. Like I'm not against it. And in some cases, actually you can see right here are the Robin two next Robin Hobb books in her trilogy on my shelf. Um, those are paperbacks that I chose to get in that edition because I liked that edition so much in terms of dog earring and writing and highlighting in books. I don't have like, it's not like against my religion the way it is for some people. Um, but I don't personally dog ear pages. Um, I have like, I'll just use whatever's around as a bookmark. And then, like I was saying, if I'm really trying to like process a book, I will often write or highlight in it. Um, but not all the time. Um, let's see here. I used, I used to think I couldn't take in an ebook like physical books, but then I realized I remember tweet threads from months ago. I used to talk myself out of ebooks just so I can justify buying the physical. Yeah, I can, I remember what happens in ebooks. I just don't, it doesn't sit with me as deeply, I think, as things I read physically. Yeah, that's another good benefit is that e-reading does have an integrated dictionary. So, you know, if you're reading in a different language or, you know, you just are trying to expand your vocabulary as you go that can be a benefit as well. I prefer reading uh, from paperbacks. Hardbacks are, are more expensive and heavy. I read in bed a lot and I've dropped too many hardbacks on my face. I have done that a number of times and it is a rude awakening. Um, I do, you know, there is something satisfying about the like floppiness of a really thick paperback. I will agree there. Um, but I, I do personally prefer, if I'm going to own it physically, to me, 
I'd rather have an edition I think is going to last a while. Um, yeah, and I use the dust jacket as my my bookmark a lot of times. Um, let's see here. Yeah, that's a good point, Karen. So part of this, the reason I like reading is to get away from the screen so ebooks can be useless in that way. That's that's a very fair point. <laughs> They're not if if screen time is an issue or something you're concerned about, that definitely doesn't help. Though you know, to be fair, as we were, as a lot of comments mentioned, and I was agreeing with, I do find that um, this kind of screen reading doesn't strain my eyes the way that reading from a phone does. So. You know, it's a kind of a different type of screen time, maybe. So I think about it. I commute to work and I actually miss people observing what I read and stop me, stopping me to comment and ask questions about what I read. Um, can't do that with e-readers. That is true. Um, I am a nosy, nosy gal. And um, whenever I'm in public, I do like to see what other people are reading. Um, <laughs> makes a good point that the bedtime bookworms <laughs> username checks out. Um, let's see here. Uh, okay. Yeah, this is, we, I brought this, we've been talking a little bit about this just in general. I think e-readers and e-reading can be very helpful for a variety of uh, different kind of like, um, physical limitations people might have. So the point of, um, I'm chronically ill and can't easily hold up a paper book, especially a big one. So Kindle is a godsend. Yeah. I think that's a great point. Um, and you know, same for people who have like sightedness issues and need to bump up the font. Like, I think just having more ready, ready, ready access for people who have either hearing or sight issues um, through technology is like one of the cool, like one of the upsides of technology. I think people can get very Luddite about like the computers are taking us over, but there, there's a reason, there's advantages to it as well. I love audiobooks. Um, Nancy says, first timer. Hello. Hello. What about audiobooks? Your thoughts? I love audiobooks. Um, I'm somebody who is, I primarily am an audiobook listener for nonfiction because I process nonfiction type information verbally really well. Like that tends to be, I, I'm a, a verbal, like I'm a, I learn by explaining things or by talking through things. So having someone talk through things to me in nonfiction is very, like, I remember well that way. Um, I also tend to like mystery and fantasy on audio. Uh, so I can't read everything in audio, but I really enjoy it. And I definitely have very little patience for any, like, audiobooks aren't real books, like, please. So there you go. Um, yes, multitask and focus better. I agree. I like being able to do multiple things at once. Uh, yeah. Let's see here. Oh, that's a great point. So um, the second point is I'm in New Zealand and shipping can cost as much as a hardcover or more and take weeks. So automatic downloads are wonderful. That is a great point. Um, yes. Oh, yeah. I do like asking people how they're reading. Denise, I get this question a lot. How did you come up with your name? I honestly don't remember. It's just It's just always been there. Um, thank you, Lil though. Let's see. I think the main downside to e-readers is that they can run out of battery, so you have to wait to recharge them, and you never have to recharge a paperback. That's a great point. Also, if you're going into a bathtub, maybe don't take your e-reader with you, because that could end badly. Um, I do find that's the, that is part of what I was talking about. Of I found over time that the Kindles have gotten worse and worse made. And the number one way I see that is that their battery life gets worse and worse. Like every new one I get has a worse battery situation. So I do find that these can hold a charge long enough for me to take any trip I was going to go on. Like I wouldn't, I could charge this before I left the house and go to Europe. And by the time I got settled back in my hotel, this would still have enough charge. So like this can get me through a pretty good chunk of time, but it is it, in the first version I had that battery, I feel like lasted like a hundred hours or something crazy. And I do, I do find that that has gotten worse over time, but that's maybe that's just the ones I've had or whatever. Uh, yeah, waiting for paperback releases is, is a struggle, um, but they are cheaper. That is true. Um, 
books are antiquated and screens will demolish the publishing industry. Yep. People keep waiting for ebooks to destroy publishing and it just keeps not happening. Um, Wes says, time is an issue for me. I'm a mommy during the day and a reader at night, which is why I have come to appreciate my paper white e-reader. Yeah. And, you know, I do think um, if you are somebody who is reading in bed and your partner goes to sleep before you do, that is another nice feature of an e-reader is that you can keep reading without disturbing, you know, anybody who is trying to not have light on around you. Um, yes. And e I agree. Um Ebooks definitely are a space saver, which is a big advantage. Just I, like I mentioned earlier, I used to move every two years or so. And uh, that was very helpful when I was trying not to have as many physical books. <sighs> That's weird. Um, let's see here. Why do I feel like I... Why do I always feel like I haven't, quote unquote, haven't read the book if I only listened to the audiobook? Some sort of will, weird guilt, LOL. Yeah, I... Um, You've, you've read it. <laughs> it's just a different way of taking in information. And I always, my thing is always like, it used to be weird to read silently to yourself. Like in um, the Confessions, St. Augustine talks about like happening upon somebody who was reading silently to themselves and being like, what what is this strange new magic? Um, so it used to be normal that if you were going to read a book or read a text, you would read it out loud. So audiobooks are just going back to the days of yore, really. Thank you so much. Um, oh, okay. Here's the story. I don't, I forgot that. I think the story you told about your username was people would see your house for the first time and be like, wow, that's a lot of books. Yeah, that's, that checks out. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me, Zoe. I, I, I never can remember. Um, yes, e-readers don't get dusty the same way that physical books do. Uh, I hate taking a paper book into the bath. I've ruined a Kindle that way, but they make waterproof cases that I use in the bath now. Good to know. So if you are, that's true. Cause if you take a paper book into the bath, it does often get like that warped page situation, which is not great. So eBooks are searchable. That is true. So if you want to skip ahead to your favorite scene, that's easier to find. Um, or a Ziploc plastic bag for an e-reader cover. That's a good tip as well. Um, what else was I going to talk about here? Yeah. Okay. iPad. I have read eBooks on iPad and laptop. Uh, I don't find that to be as pleasant of an experience, but there have been times where I didn't have an e-reader available. I had no books with me, gas pour. And, um, so an iPad was all I had and it'll get the job done, but I do find similar to what people in the chat were saying. I do find there's eye strain. Um, it's not, I can't read as long that way. It's not very comfortable to me. Uh, yeah, just generally to me, not as pleasant of an experience, but not like a deal breaker if that's the only thing available. Um, Awesome. Um, let's see here. I sometimes find with an audiobook, my attention can wander doing something with my hand helps. I very much find that. So that's why I really like audiobooks when I'm driving or when I'm doing laundry or dishes, or sometimes I'll just sit there and like do a Sudoku while I listen to an audiobook or whatever. Um, or, you know, pet my kitty cats or whatever. So yeah, I, I find that too. Okay. We're seconding. Apparently the Ziploc is a pretty good hack for your e-readers. Uh, going into the bath. What time of day do you like to read? I read as often as I can. <laughs> I read a lot in the evenings. Um, when I had a commute, I would listen to audiobooks in my commute. Just whenever I can slot it in. You'll if you if you always have a book with you, you'll find that you have a lot of opportunities to read in little stolen moments. Yeah. Um. Don't know if you mentioned this, but sometimes when I read a physical book now, I'm bummed when I can't easily highlight a line that I like. Yeah, I don't do a lot of that in my e-reading. Um, it, it sounds like there's a little bit of a divide between people who really like that feature of e-reading or use it a lot and people who don't. Um, it's not something I do often, but I, I see if you got used to that, that it would be sad to not have that there. Uh <laughs> 
<laughs> scandalous. Just pure clumsiness, Alice. Not all of us have your grace and dignity in the bath, okay? I'm I'm a klutz in all things in life. Um, digitally reading means you don't risk damaging the books when out in the world. That is true. Uh, yeah, that is true. Sometimes if I have really nice editions of a book, I'll I'll be more inclined to to reading it with an e-copy. Um. I this is such a struggle for me listening to an audiobook but also buying the physical copy because my wallet loves pain. I have found on several occasions I own the the audiobook and then I want to have a physical copy and I never have let myself do it but I'm always tempted. The number one one like that for me is stamp from the beginning. I bought the audiobook the first time I read it and now I can't bring myself to spend the money on a physical copy, especially because they're in such high demand right now. Um, but I would like one. <laughs> but I already bought it as an audiobook, so I'm like, I can't, I can't double buy this. This is too much. Um, yeah, there you go. Animal Crossing and uh, audiobooks, perfect. Uh, I have. I was alluding to that earlier that I pulled myself away from the deep dive into all of the Tati Shane stuff to come do this. So we can talk about my thoughts if people are interested, but it is a lot. Um, I'm a slow reader. So I just experimented with speeding up audiobooks per recommendation at 1.5 worked for me. Hope to train myself to 1.75. Well, yay. I'm glad that that's working. Um, I actually, I've just, I forget which list, um, which listener, <laughs> sorry, which, uh, app I was using that allowed me to go to 2.5. And that often is like a great speed for me, but not all of them will let you do that. I love to listen to a book while physically ebook reading. It helps me not get too distracted or like I can get distracted with my eyes and keep my momentum going. That is a great point, Jade. I've seen a lot of people like I have some videos recommending like the best or not the best, but like my experiences with different um, subscription services and several people in my Kindle Unlimited video have mentioned that they like that you can also get the audio to read along with the ebook. Um, that's not something I do very often. But I, it seems like that's something a, a lot of people enjoy doing. Um, I've tapped a word in my paper book and wonder why the definition didn't come up. I do feel like at some point I've like tap like tapped something expecting it to move, um, and it just didn't. Let's see here. Oh man, if I could buy all three formats for a reduced bulk price, I would totally do that. I agree. For some of my favorite books, I would absolutely love to have an e copy an audio and a physical. That would be great. What do you do when you're in a reading slump? I actually made a video about this a couple months ago because I was in a slump. So I have all of my tips there. At a high level, I think the first thing to do is like, don't fight it. The more you fight it, the worse it will get. So like you kind of got to write it out and then ease back in with some mood reading and stick with like favorite authors, favorite genres, like do some real pleasure reading uh, and kind of go slow from there. Yeah. Animal Crossing lovers unite here. Give me those drama thoughts. I'm so nosy. Uh, other people don't even know who Tati is. What? It, whoa, oh, man. I wish I didn't have brain space taken up by this stuff to, to not even know who Tati is. Um, I double I double by use. There's less urgency so I can take my time looking for a deal. There you go. Perfect. Um, okay, we've got, okay, so it sounds like there's enough people interested in the drama that I'll give a, a quick rundown here in a minute. Um, oh, I really love D'Angelo Wallace. I feel like he's doing the good Lord's good work out here. He has a great, like, shading of Shane from about a year ago, I think, or I guess when the series, the last series came out. Um, my Kindle eBooks can be read by Alexa, not perfect but not bad at all for reading by a bot. Good to know. Appreciate that, that review. Um, just got rid of my Audible subscription and using Google Books. Like it so far. Okay, good to know. Good to know. Um, yeah, D'Angelo is great. Also, did you, oh, well, on that note, uh, what was that? Shh. Lester Shallon Lester whatever that woman's name was that was like a whole that was a weird little like one week drama that was going on a while ago but that was bizarre there we go um 
For most audiobooks, 1.25 is the fastest I can go, but it can depend on the narrator. They have different paces. This is very true. I feel like a lot of audio narrators are trained to speak very slowly. And that's why I speed up because I cannot pay attention to someone. Like you can tell, I talk fast, I listen fast, like I can't focus. Um, so, but it does depend. If the reader is naturally faster, I reduce the speed. Okay, William, thank you. Okay, this is one of the big cons to e-reading, I think, is that because, so he says, I have I got more than a thousand books on the e-reader. Because e-books are often, can be gotten for so cheap. Like, I often, I like, honestly, sp spending more than $3 on an e-book pains me a little bit. Like, $2.99 is about as much as I will go. But most of the ebooks I get are 99 cents or free, like, honestly, um, unless it's like a repeat author or a book I've been waiting for. And consequently, I have, I have, when I first realized this, probably in I think 2014 or 15, I went ham and I got so many books that I will never read. And like, I think it does lend to me piling up books on my own TBR that I wouldn't if I was having to get them all physically. So I think that is one con to e-reading is that I think it can, you can accidentally buy 10 books for 99 cents and maybe you don't read, like you read one of them or you could have spent that money towards like one book that you were actually really excited about. So I do think it can lend itself to like, kind of like thoughtless consumerism. At least it has for me. I think that's one of the downsides. Yes. Tap in that physical book. Uh, yes, I totally agree. I love novellas for reading slumps. They can be a great, if you like novellas, they can be a good, um, a good help. Okay. We've got, we've got a consensus here, so we can, we'll talk about this drama. Um, I've been using my fourth gen Kindle since 2011 that has physical page turner buttons. Yes, which is the main reason I have still not had to upgrade to a Kindle Paperwhite. Oasis is too expensive for me. Yes, that was the first one I ever had. It had the physical buttons and it lasted me like five years. And the only reason I had to get rid of it was because something, I think I dropped it or something and like I messed up the battery and it wasn't holding a charge. And I tell you, after I got rid of the one that had the physical buttons, no Kindle has ever been as good of quality. So Chronicle 5, as long as you can hold on to that, do it. Because <laughs> you'll, I mean, I like the new ones. They are lighter, which is nice, but they, I don't think they last as long. Uh, oh, I read and highlighted an ebook and discovered I could send the highlighted passages to a printer and had automatic notes. I did not know that. Okay, well, that's awesome. I wish I had known that in grad school. Um, ooh, yep, Shallon Lester apparently is still around here being messy. I'm between 1.75 and 2.5 on most books, depending on the narrator and accent. That is pretty much me exactly. Yes, Scribd for ebooks. I the my problem with Scribd is that it doesn't integrate with Kindle, um, like a paper white, and that is how I like to read my ebooks. So, you know. For me, it's not as great of an experience because I don't really like to read on my iPad, but I do love Scribd for audiobooks. Yeah. Oh, YouTube. I wait for those deals too. Okay, more more kudos for Scribd and Libby. Um, I started on 1.5, but quickly jumped to 1.75. I've tried to, but not there yet. You know, he'll train there and get there. Yes, Beauty Guru Chatter is on 11th mega thread. And I think they're going to hit 12 here just shortly because it is popping off as, as the kids would say. Are there any novellas you loved? Oh, so many. My One of my all-time favorite novellas is um, A Kiss for Midwinter by Courtney Milan. I reread it every Christmas and it's so good. Technically, I guess probably my favorite novella is All Systems Red by Martha Wells, because really, it's basically a novella. So there you go. What are your thoughts on Little Fires Everywhere? I have not read it. It didn't really appeal to me, but I've a lot of people like it. Audiobook speed can be, a learn, can be learned. I've uh, been able to train my ear over the years, and I've sped up over time. So if you can't go as fast as you want to yet, be patient. You can work your way up. I think that is very good advice. Um, okay. <laughs> Did the Alexa uh, reading in French. Going to try English next. 
Uh, even if I overbuy on ebooks, it's, at least it's not taking up space by overbuying physical books. That's a very good point. Um, and I guess that's never been really like, I think I'm, I'm pretty good about getting rid of physical books as I read them. Like I'm always unhauling. So I've never quite had that problem, but that's fair enough. Um, e yes, this is another great pro. I think e-reading can be great for older out of print novels, particularly being, particularly being in Australia, trying to find older novels that can get really expensive to try and order physical copies of them. Um, I find that's also true, like cross cross country, across countries. Like I've had obscure British, um, detective novels I've been looking for and it is either difficult or expensive to get them physically, but I can get the ebook, you know, more than I'd want to pay for it, but at least it's available. So that's a great point too. Uh, we've got a phone e-reader. There you go. What happens to your ebook collection when you die? You can bequeath your books. What about your e-reader? I've always wondered, like everyone mentions, we all have an extensive collection. So I think I mentioned this earlier, you actually technically don't own ebooks. You are leasing them long term from the provider, but that's a good point. I don't know if it's for your lifetime or how that works. So I don't know. Um, question for Judy Carroll. Uh, I miss the physical buttons on e-reader so much. It's so difficult to hold an e-reader or carry it around without touching the screen and accidentally highlighting, defining words, bookmarking, et cetera. I agree. I'm so, so on having it be only touch screen. Um, okay. Here's a plug for a nook going loud and proud. Um, Ah, oh, all systems read. I feel like we come to this point every chat where we just talk about the good news of our, our friend Murderbot. You're so welcome. I'm glad you've gotten to experience it. Um, yes, I enjoy Audible as a way to support authors who I want to support, and I'd rather read their book as an e uh, audiobook than a physical book. Um, <laughs> don't get peed up for a paperback. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, when I was moving around a lot, I, I was much more conscious of the number of physical books. Um, oh, okay. This was going around at the time, Alice. I, we will get there here in just a second. I'll, I'll wrap up my e-reader thoughts and I'll give you the five minute, my five minute take on the drama and then we'll we'll start wrapping up. Um, I really love e-reading e through my library. It's so satisfying to finish them and return them and see my digital library go up and down. Again, to me, that is one of the main benefits of e-reading is getting access to my library's e-library. Um, now, granted, I know some people's libraries don't have as good of a collection, but I think if you like do some investigation, if your library doesn't have a very good ebook collection, there's a very good chance that you are eligible to um, get access to state level libraries collection. Or sometimes you can pay kind of like a pretty nominal fee. Usually it's like, well, I guess it depends. Some of the ones I've seen are like $20 um, to be able to have access to a library who has a good collections collection. So to me, that's one of the best parts of e-reading. I think I'm strange in that I start all audiobooks at one speed, 1.0 speed, and then speed up as I get more invested in the book. I've never heard of that, but I like that as a strategy. Um, I think John Oliver, someone did a special on the idea of inheriting e-reader libraries and it can't be done. It's only for the purchaser's lifetime. Okay, there you go. There you go. Uh, we should start drinking <laughs> where we all drink when someone in the chat says they read Murderbot Diaries based on Mars Wreck. We would all be so sloshed, which, you know, there's worse things that we could be. Um, there we go. YouTube. Uh, that game <laughs> to emergency room visits. You can download apps from libraries in different states. Uh, I think if you want to access New York and California's libraries, you can pay a fee and just check out books for the, from their systems. That is true. And I will tell you, um, I, until this year, still had access to the DC library um, from when I lived there. And it had been 10, not, uh, not quite 10, but like eight years. And they finally kicked me off. I guess they finally did an audit or something of like, oh, this person hasn't physically renewed their library card in eight years. So there you go. 
Um, let me see here. Any other things I wanted to say about e-reading? I guess basically I do really enjoy e-reading. I guess the only other real benefit to me, if you are a fellow booktuber or a fellow like online content creator, is that it is a lot easier to get, um, advanced reader copies as e-copies as opposed to physical. Um, uh, some publishers require you have at least 5,000 or 10,000 subscribers before they will give you physical arcs, but they are much more willing to give you an electronic arc. Um, and I do find, I think if I was doing all of my arc reading as physical copies, that would honestly, I think it kind of overwhelming because I do read a lot of advanced reader copies, especially for like romance and fantasy and mystery. I don't know. I, and those are genres I like to e-read. So I definitely am glad that that's sort of where things are tilted and again, I just think it's easier to get access uh, if you are a reviewer to an e-copy as opposed to a physical one. Our library got shut down overnight about a year ago when the building, including all the stacks, were declared an earthquake risk. Having the Libby collection was wonderful. Ditto during the lockdown. Well, I definitely agree during the lockdown, but oh, what a sad, what a sad moment for the library physically. Oh, okay. Yes, I'm very thankful during the lockdown for e-collections. Okay, to avoid the hospital, we could just drink tea or sparkling water. Do you use the Hula app? I have. It's not my favorite, and I really will only do it if it's a book I really want to read, and that's the only way I can get it for free, but it's not my personal favorite. Murderbot is so fun, and I will read, listen to all of them. Yay, have a drink, everyone. LOL, I'm already partaking. Um, sucks that you can't permanently delete audiobooks or Kindle books. My friend wanted to lend her Audible account to her parents, but she couldn't delete the erotica books on there. Oh, there you go. Well, you know, hey, it's 2020. Get on with it, parents. It's it's no big deal. I'm definitely not logged into three different libraries on Liberty. Yeah, I had for a moment I had four. I had four, three. No, four. I had DC. Vancouver, Charlotte, and Nashville. And then Charlotte was the, Charlotte is strict about it. And they kicked me off very quickly after I moved from there. Um, but there was a brief moment where I had so many libraries that I had access to. And now I'm down to just one. Um, yeah, that's too bad. Love Murder Bob is still have not read Network Effect. I'm 60-ish on 10 copies of my library. So I think I'm just going to buy it. It is real good, but you know, patience is a virtue. So if you can wait it out, go for it. Okay. I think those are most of my thoughts about e-reading in general. I'm a big fan, not for everyone, but it is definitely an important part of kind of my reading strategy and how I maintain like you guys know I read a lot of books. I was just looking at 143 books so far this year. And a huge part of that is um, not just mixing up genres, but I do think mixing up kind of the form that I'm reading in helps me also keep some momentum. Jade has five libraries. You go, girl. Okay, so I'm going to give a quick thought about the drama. <laughs> if people care about it, I, I do. So um, is there a way to quickly recap this? I'm going to attempt to give the 60 second synopsis on YouTube. Drama Geddon one happened in 2018 in the summer of 2018 centering around Jeffree star. Uh, and basically like it was, he was peripheral to it. It was more that Gabriel Zamora tweeted something that was trying to shade Jeffree star, but it ended up blowing back on him. And in the blowback, it took down Manny MUA, Laura Lee, mostly those two. Since then, Manny has sort of bounced back. Laura, not so much. Gabriel and Nikita Dragon float on to fight another day. Dramageddon 2. Uh, we have the Bi Sister video from Tati in which she... And here's where we're... My cousin can confirm this because we were talking about this at Thanksgiving. Tati never actually came out and accused James Charles of anything criminal in that video. She basically was saying like, I think he has gotten entitled. I don't like the entitlement. I don't like who he's becoming. And he has behavior that I think could lead him down a bad path if it continues. From there, Jeffree Star hopped in and started aggressively insinuating and eventually outright calling James Charles predator. And 
certainly the behavior Tati was describing could be described as like predatory, but it wasn't outright like you are a predator. Jeffree Star comes in and directly says that. Uh, we have various people coming forward with receipts. James Charles does an apology video that's not great. Um, he takes some time, come, comes back with one that is more robust. But even at the time, I said he actually did not disprove any, uh, like some of the claims being made. He more just like proved that Toddy and Jeffrey didn't really like handle him very well. So coming out of that, my takeaway was, I think Toddy, and she was the only one I remained subscribed to after that. I think Toddy was coming from a real place. And she may have like, I don't know that that's how I would have handled the situation. But I don't think she was like, I don't think it was just hair vitamins, which I saw people saying. I'm like, I don't think that that's an honest reading of her, like what she's talking about here. So I kind of was like, I wonder, I told my cousin, I was like, I wonder if she was hearing other things about James that Jeffrey was telling her about. And that kind of gassed her up and she kind of got spun up and decided to do this. And then later regretted it or something. Sorry if you can hear the fireworks as everywhere in the US, all that happens here now is people set off fireworks. Can I see them? Oh, I can actually see them. That's exciting. Um, so that was last year's Dramageddon. The dust settles and it never really got resolved. Basically everybody said like, we're tired of fighting. We're just gonna go back in our respective corners. Meanwhile, everybody who had been following this was sort of like, okay, but like, is James Charles a predator? Did he like what was taught? Like, does are there more receipts somewhere? Like, no one really knew. And then recently, it started getting bubbled back up because Jeffrey Star started getting back into the shit. And I think coming out of the second documentary series that he did with Shane Dawson, there were some real questions about like okay, this was supposed to show us behind the scenes of what happened in Dramageddon 2, and it didn't. Like there's just a it, it raised even more open questions and recently because Jeffrey Star is Jeffrey Star, he had some like past things that were coming up. This is not a 60 second synopsis. I'm really trying, guys. <laughs> he had some past drama things that were coming up that were like really serious. So not just like fun gossipy things, like um, like aiding and abetting abetting somebody who's like being prosecuted for being a child blank. Um like just like really serious dark things. So <laughs> that happened. And then in the last couple of weeks, we've found like, I think basically because of Black Lives Matter and like holding people accountable and like really talking about some of this, some of these things, people started surfacing the fact that Shane Dawson has had a very questionable past with respect to race and with, with respect to making jokes about children, things like that. I was aware of some of this stuff. Like I, it had been said before, but I was under the impression it was more kind of in the category of like Jenna Marbles, where she had like probably two or three videos where she made basically like racist jokes. She privated them, took them down and wasn't like a repeat offender. I think what has been really eye opening for everyone, at least it was for me, because I wasn't really following YouTube at the time is just the sheer volume. Like, on it, literally, he started deleting videos that had problematic content, and he deleted 1.3 billion views from his channel. Like, it wasn't just one or two videos. It was, it seems like it was all of his videos from that era. And I, again, I don't know. I wasn't really watching YouTube at that time, but it seems like he had, like, had an entire character I wasn't aware of that was him doing blackface. He had, like all of these incredibly inappropriate jokes about children. There's a video of him and his mom asking one of his like 11 year old fans to twerk for him. Like it is dark and next level. And it wasn't just like, it's not like it's ever excusable, but I do think when you're young and you're trying to have like shock comedy, I can at least understand isn't even the right word. Like, I, we've seen that this apparently is something a lot of people go through. Though as a side note, as a woman who was raised in the South, I have never seen somebody do blackface and I have never heard the N-word said in my presence except one time from an 80-year-old white 
racist dude and literally the entire room shut him down. So I don't understand how all these YouTubers from like California are constantly doing blackface and constantly dropping the N word. Like, honestly, this is not normal. This isn't something that like all white people do. So I don't understand how all of these big YouTubers have this as a part of their past. All that to say, I can see that you might have a lapse of judgment in the in in one or two videos as like shock value comedy. These are not one or two lapses of judgment. These are like continual repeated lapses of judgment. And this is one of the biggest creators on the platform. It is really dark. I think this this car this is now Dramageddon 3, but it's actually being called Carmageddon because all the chickens are coming home to roost. And so Shane has been in like this continual being canceled situation. Jeffrey uh, seems to be immune to being canceled. I don't know, but like a, a lot darker things about Jeffrey Star in terms of like his first brand and what it was called, um, like him glorifying images of self harm. Like it's dark. It's like really dark. So both of those two two things are happening. Then <laughs> coming back into the picture today, Tati Westbrook re-entered the chat. And basically explained that she was led to believe that there was a series of allegations against James, like a series of issues with him, and that all of that was going to come to light. And basically exactly what I was telling my cousin at Thanksgiving, except much darker, that Shane and Jeffrey and Shane were gassing her up. That's the part that's so shocking is that Shane was involved in this. And anyway, I was watching all the videos on this. My basic opinion is I feel horrible if there's actually that voice note out there. I feel horrible for the person whose story that is, if it's true. I don't know if Jeffrey paid somebody to create a voice note like that. I don't think that's like out of the realm of possibility. So like, we don't know if it's true. If it is like Jeffrey Star is a piece of shit for <laughs> spreading that around. Um, if it's not true, he's a piece of shit for trying to make that drop. Like, either way, he's a piece of shit. I think that video makes a lot of the pieces of the puzzle that we have seen over the last two years make a lot more sense. I think prior to Sister Geddon, Tati had been pretty out of the drama. So, like, I'm not saying she's... I think she made a lot of mistakes in how she handled things, but her story makes sense to me. Um, and seems congruent with the character of the people involved. So that's my opinion on the drama. I tried to do that as quickly as possible. I hope that that was not too onerous. Okay. Um, let's see here. First, straight up seems like something Jeffrey would do. Yes. I have no idea who any of these people are. I guess that's a good thing. It is. It. You don't need this drama and darkness in your life, honestly. Once you get sucked in, it's very hard to get out of. Yes, Ashley, it is exhausting. Um, I don't watch any big YouTubers. Too many toxic people make big bucks doing shady nonsense. Obviously not all, but definitely the ones I'm talking about. Yes. And that was part of the scandal that was happening a week ago with Shane was like, he released this apology, whatever it was. And he was saying like, the beauty community is just toxic. And pretty much everyone was like, no, the people you hang out with are toxic, which is like two or three people out of hundreds of creators. On the level of Onision, I don't think so because I don't I don't think we've seen real evidence that he is like actually doing things in real, real life to people. I just think his choice of humor is in horrible taste and is it violates the sense of common decency, I think. The base of his early YouTube career was just racism and gross comments about children. Exactly. And I just don't, I wasn't around then. And I think seeing like all of these clips surface being like, oh my God, like, is this all you did? And it seems like that was like all his humor was. Um, I remember Shane's early YouTube videos. Every video for years was full of racist, offensive content. That was his entire channel until 2014. Okay, that's interesting. Cause like, I literally didn't even know he who he was until like 2018. And I think people kind maybe like me just weren't like had no idea it was that intense yeah exactly thank you he was in his 20s but he was in his early like our brains don't finish developing until 25 like impulse control is a problem so like yeah certainly old enough to know better but like impulse control is a thing until you're 25 um yeah 
Oh, that Willow Smith. Yeah, the Willow Smith thing was awful. Don't Google it. Spare yourself. I don't even want to describe what that was. Um, I've been trying to figure out what is happening. I've been so lost. It's hard to catch up. If you are looking for a summary, uh, Beauty Guru Chatter subreddit does have a mega thread with some summaries of everything that's happened. Um, oh, okay. I'm glad that that made a little bit of sense. I tried. <laughs> it's hard if you don't know who all these people are. Um, yes, check out D'Angelo Wallace's G YouTube and Twitter account. I think he does the best job of consolidating the information that's out there right now. And he's just a great creator in general. So I would endorse him writ large. Who's your favorite author? Uh, Agatha Christie. Tati has a serious savior complex. Why did she think she could save Jeffrey? He's always been trash. I think that that's a really fair critique. I think, I don't know. I think sometimes we think or believe what we want to. It's, I don't know. And I, I think honestly, like, I think she had that. And I think she also like, She's never been one of like the cool kids in the beauty YouTube space. So I wonder if she also sort of had like a, oh, this is my chance to like, you know, kind of have a different type of community or a different type of audience. Like, I think that's a pretty human response, but, and maybe she justified that to herself by telling herself that she was helping him like on a new path. I don't know. Um, his content used to be akin to Onision's, but at the very least, Shane Dawson has grown to become somewhat, become more self-aware while Onision, well, yeah. And I do think that's true. I mean, I don't think that he's still doing that stuff. And that's why I say, I don't think that it like is as deep or real as the Onision stuff, but it's the same genre of grossness, if that makes sense. Yes. Um... Shane was originally a shock-based content creator. He no longer fit, uh, fits that description. Should he face the consequences? Yes, but not to the full extent because he doesn't primarily do shock videos. I would agree with that more if I felt like he actually had some sort of like accountability. And I don't, he, I know he released his apology video. I just was so full of like, I'm not that person anymore. And that is not a real apology, like period. It's not, it's not taking accountability of like, I chose to do this. I chose to be this kind of content creator. And if I were doing it again, I would not choose to do that. But that is what I chose to do at the time. It was hurtful. I did it. I myself did it. I have learned and grown since then, but I did it. Um, and I just, I'm always suspicious when people talk about like, I'm not that person anymore because it's trying to distance yourself from the reality of like, you are the one who did it. Um, you know, we can all learn and grow, but it starts with true accountability. And the fact that he is more emotional about that toddy video that just went up than he was about apologizing for that content to me says a lot about him. That's just my opinion. I remember the old YouTubers doing stupid stuff, dark and racist stuff, crazy. I never watched that. Just did music and funny. Um, yeah. Yes, I saw that Philip DeFranco summary. Yes, yeah, so if you're looking for a summary, that's a pretty good one. Um, yeah, and I guess, and maybe to contrast this, now I want to be clear that what Jenna Marbles was apologizing for is not mine to accept or to not accept. But I think that coming from an outsider's perspective, they're both content creators from that era. And I think that she has demonstrated through her actions pretty consistently that she doesn't really align herself with that kind of like shock humor anymore in the moment she chose to do that. And I think her apology video is a good example of like, she explains exactly what was wrong with what she said. She like shows you the con the clip. This is what was wrong about it. Here's what I learned from it. And here's the action I'm taking for it. This whole like cancel culture drove Jenna Marbles off of YouTube. A, I kind of think she's been wanting to leave for a while, but B, it's not that she's like taking accountability and accepting a consequence that she feels personally is appropriate. And I think that isn't that to me, that's something that's commendable. Um, so I don't know. I think that that's to me though, that's a good example of like actually a good apology in the sense of you really are explaining here's what was wrong with what I did. It was me who did it. I am sorry. And here's like where I've grown from it. 
the fact that Shane was on Instagram live reacting to Tati's video and also dismissing Tati's personal essay claims is just really awful. Yes, I found that incredibly distasteful. He literally rolled her eyes when she was explaining the fact that part of why she was susceptible to believing some of the things that they were telling her is that she herself has survived that. And I will say that I'm also somebody who's experienced sexual violence and I am somebody who tends to mostly believe um, if there, unless it's like not a credible claim for some reason, like I tend to believe victims because I know how hard it is to speak about that and that that is not something you just like make up for fun because it is life ruining. <laughs> um, so hurt people want to fix bad people, even though there's no hopes. Yeah, I think that's too, true. I think that there's some people who just like by their disposition, um, just like, always kind of want to help or fix people. And I think that can get to be a toxic cycle. So um, thank you, Ryan, Ryland's misogynist and ageist tweets. The ageism is showing. And I thought that was so gross. Yeah. He used to feel more this way too, but after watching the copious amounts of him sexualizing children frequently to their faces. Yeah. That kind of is what tipped me too. Cause I do, you know, again, I do believe people can change and grow, but I think you have to own it and you have to show you, you really have to own that. And I do think that there can come a tipping point of people saying like, you know what? It's just too much. Like it's too much for me to forget. It's too much for me to whatever. Um, Shane literally rolled his eyes when she was mentioning her essay after he literally made a video mentioning his abuse to explain away his past behavior. Yeah. Um, because here's the issue I have. Shane is canceled because he is too well known. His past will keep him from getting a good job. Granted, he doesn't need the money, but if we don't work, our mental health declines. Again, sometimes that's a part of taking accountability for what you did. And I'm not I'm not worried about him, like, being on the streets. He is going to be fine. And even though he has lost a lot of subscribers, he still has more than 20 million. He is going to be fine. That's sad <laughs> to me he's going to be fine. So is probably Jeffrey star. And I don't, you know, I hope that he, I, I heard Peter Bond saying this and I totally agree. I hope everybody involved in this has people around them that love them and care about them surrounding them right now. Everybody deserves to have that. I hope he has, you know, Ryland and whoever who are supporting him on a personal level, but in terms of like being a public figure, like, sometimes your actions have consequences. Like that's just the bottom line. And I hope he has, I hope he has a great therapist to help him through this. I think he probably needs that. Um, but that doesn't like, I can't like, and let's put this, put it this way. The one example is Willow Smith. Like her family has pretty publicly come out and said like apology not accepted. And the bottom line is I'm not going to outweigh his potential response to that to the actual victim of that situation and their response to it. So, you know, I don't want to be, I don't, I don't believe in canceling people. I believe in canceling behavior and I think his behavior deserves to be canceled. And that may mean that he doesn't have the same opportunities that he would have had before. Seems like millions of people seem to, to be okay with his original content. If he's this popular, that's the real problem. Did all of his follow followers not know this? And that's the thing, Kay, like, it it he has made apologies about this in the past and the way that it had been presented to me was like yeah he had a couple of, of problematic things in the past but he addressed it he apologized he's totally moved forward i think what you know me as somebody who hadn't watched him from back then that was how it was presented and i think what has come up recently is like oh no it wasn't like one or two videos that he apologized specifically for and like showed change and moved on it was like his entire content, like all of it. Um, so I think a lot of people like me who found him in the last couple of years because of his sort of new content he was doing were not aware of really what the nature of that original channel was. Um, and, you know, that's on us. Like I probably, I'd heard people say like, oh, he has this pass. And I, I don't know. I just heard enough people saying like, oh yeah, but like he, he kind of moved on from that. And he's an example of somebody who moved on from that behavior. But I think especially in light of the fact of who he associates himself with and the, and this, you know, kind of new Carmageddon and his role in that, I think it's kind of people seeing like, oh, I don't think you've actually really 
learned and grown from this and the way that it was kind of presented that you had. Um, hypothetical. Yeah, that's fair, Derek. Um, I'm not trying to minimize Shane's past trauma because that is valid regardless. Just odd he gets mentioned his past abuse and she can't. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's see here. A lot of his followers seem fine with ignoring his... That's that's kind of my point. I mean, he's losing subscribers, but like not... He still has more than 20 million subscribers. So, yeah. If he doesn't work as he gets canceled, it will hurt him psychologically. Nobody deserves that. I do... I'm going to just say I don't want him to be hurt psychologically like in a torturous way, but like I do think that your behavior and the consequences of it should weigh on you. I think you should have professionals to help you work through that and people who love you and care about you regardless of your behavior around you to support you through that but I do think that it's you know there's a reason why like in religious traditions we talk about the idea of penance like that's a common kind of concept in philosophy or like retributive justice like this idea of like guilt or shame can be constructive and I hope that he uses this opportunity to have those emotions in a constructive way. Um, I think mental health is also ma massively affected by being such a public figure for sure. And I mean, like, I don't think, you know, yeah, I think it's gotta be such a weird trip having that many people follow you. And I really do think it, is very hard for that to not warp your perception perception of of action. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think that that's fair, but I it's part of the reason why I never want to be a person who has twenty million people subscribe to them on YouTube. Um, this is facts. <laughs> Let us be real; he would never be treated so well on YouTube if he wasn't white and if they weren't getting a cut. Yes. Oh, going back to YouTube. Okay, at the time. The T was that the reason why Dramageddon 2 was ceased was that it was reported that YouTube mediators got involved and had them all put it to bed. So it doesn't surprise me when she said YouTube asked her to take that video down because that was a rumor at the time was that YouTube basically got involved and said, we can't have all of our big creators fighting like this. It's not good for our bottom line. Um, oh, yeah. Jeffrey's not saying a word. Let's see. Yeah, and I, I think that it's good, like, to I think different people can kind of have different lines of, like, what they can kind of come back from and what they can't. Um, for me, seeing all that was like, oh, I can just never really look at you in the same way again. Um, a lot of Black YouTubers are trying to get this info out about Shane and, Shane and Jeffrey for what seems like a long time. I think something positive we can all do is just listen to them more. That is a fantastic point, Ashley. You know, I like, and actually just as like taking accountability and growing. So at the time that that palette was released, I was following the series and I was like, you know, okay, like I've heard, it seems like a lot of people are saying that they, it seems like Jeffree Star has changed and like trying to move on. Okay, like maybe, maybe I'll just get this palette just cause like, does it really matter? And I will tell you, as soon as I bought, I bought the mini controversy one, as soon as I bought it, like literally the next day I was like, oh, that doesn't really sit right with me. And then I got it. And then I was doing a live where I was swatching it for people to show like, Hey, this actually isn't that unique. Like you don't need to buy this. And I privated that video because I realized like it didn't sit right with me at the time. I don't really know why I did that. And if I had to do it over again, I certainly would not. Um, so like, I guess just as a point of accountability, like I really, I don't like that piece. I regret that judgment. Like I wouldn't do that again. I think it was wrong. I knew that there was like some controversy, but I was willing and probably frankly, because he, both of them are very charismatic and white and successful. I was, I think taken in by the idea of like, okay, like it seems like they're growing and moving on from whatever it was that was in the past. And like, that was a mistake in judgment. Like, I wish I had not given them money. If you were ever wondering about Jeffree Star Cosmetics, I was not impressed. So you're not missing anything. And that I regret that, you know, like, and I wish to your point, Ashley, like, I wish that I had taken more seriously things that people were saying at the time and thought about it more before I just sort of pushed by. Um, 
Yeah, I kind of, I, my read on Tati is that she's not a bad person. Fundamentally, I think she got manipulated. Um, but that's, she has to take accountability for that. And I think she's doing that. I think that's part of why she didn't let James come into that video. And I think that was the right decision. Um, let's see here. There's been a lot of talk about parasocial relationships regarding content creators recently. Have you experienced some of this? Feel like commenting on it? I have. I actually filmed my June wrap up today and I was making, I have an end comment about housekeeping, basically saying, um, how to say this. Well, I guess I'll just refer you to that. It'll come out Thursday, but it is something the more I grow, the more I struggle to have, like to, to process the parasocial relationships people want to have with me um, and how to navigate that and how, and then that makes me think about parasocial relationships I've had with other content creators and makes me think about that in a new light. Um, again, I don't know this guy, but people seem to be making excuses for his bad behavior. We can forgive someone who is genuinely sorry, but can we please stop making excuses for them? That is very well summed up. Okay. I agree with that. And again, to Ashley's point earlier, I think we're much more likely to do that because of who he is and what he looks like. Um, half the time I comment on videos, I'm warning people about getting too attached to people we don't know. That is so true. And I think I've gotten better about that. There's only a few I have left that I'm truly, like, I'm very attached to Smoky Glow because I started following her when she had 600 subscribers. So I'm, I really hope, like, I will be super sad if she ever, like, super lets me down. Um, but I think I've gotten better about sort of guarding my heart against that because, like, if nothing else, all YouTubers are humans and humans will always let you down. Um, let's see here. I don't know about this stuff, but Amanda BB is a funny beauty YouTuber who makes videos about this. I love Amanda. I started watching her probably about eight months ago because maybe Hannah from Smoky Glow, somebody in that little smaller beauty YouTube world, um, recommended her and she is so funny. She has great commentary. Her Tiger King commentary video is everything. I highly recommend her. She is great. And she does have a very, I think, great commentary about what's been going on recently. Um, let's see here. Um, I'll be honest, I bought the mini controversy experimenting with makeup kind of got me into doing it regularly. That's great. I mean, I, I hope you enjoy doing that. And I, like I was saying, I did the same thing. Um, and I regret it now. So um, Ashley says, yeah, if there's one thing Jeffrey's good at, it's marketing. So don't feel too bad about getting sucked in. I've definitely done things like that before and then been like, oh no, that was exactly how I felt. Like literally as soon as I, I think part of it was they built it up so much. It was like the thrill of the hunt and like being part of this big internet moment. And as soon as I did it, I was like, well, that felt kind of hollow. <laughs> um, and not hollow like Christine, um, H O L L O W not H O L O. Um, yeah, sometimes the greatest growth comes from the great fall. Shane will be fine. But if he truly wishes to grow, this is a journey he will have to go through to be better. Yeah, I think that's really well said. Oh, I love watching other booktubers, but we're not, we don't have drama on this scale. <laughs> um, Smoky Glow, I enjoy her videos so much. I'm trying to make sure I give myself some space from these people. She's one I just can't have space from anymore because I just I I literally feel invested in her like she was like a little cousin of mine because I've just like I've been watching her get through college and like watching her grow and get her collab and get engaged I I really I hope I hope she stays true to herself because oh it's gonna be so sad if she if she bums me out I always like YouTubers who are presenting a thing, commenting on a thing, whether it's books, makeup, music, film, rather than folks who are bloggers and lifestyle type creators. It weirds me out to be so involved in someone else's life. I tend to agree. And I think especially with like family vloggers, that really weirds me out. I'm very glad I never got into that because like all of that with kids is just real creepy to me. Um, and I find most vloggers are kind of boring after a while if they don't have something more going on. So I don't know. I've seen comments speculating that Shane is also a victim of Shane Jeffrey's manipulation. I wonder if there's any truth to that or if it's just people excusing Shane's behavior again. Uh, I think that 
it could be true, but honestly, the thing that keeps me from ever re like, I think I would be more inclined to that if I didn't see all, and this is why that past of his coming up now recontextualizes everything because it makes you realize like, oh, like he doesn't just have friends who do this stuff. Like he has done a lot of this stuff and that makes it harder for me to believe that he's just sort of like coming into this like innocent as a lamb kind of thing. And maybe that's not fair to him that I'm more willing to believe Tati was manipulated than he was. And and maybe he was, but um, I don't know. Just the fact that he continues to be friends with Trisha Paytas weirds me out. I mean, honestly. Um, yeah. Old days of, of YouTube. Yeah, that's a good point, Alice, that both can be true and it can still be bad. Family vloggers are so bad. Those kids can't consent. It grosses me out when I see a thumbnail every time. Yeah, I, yeah, all of that stuff is really weird to me. And, you know, I'm nosy about some, like Raw Beauty Christie just got pregnant. Like I am nosy and would be interested to hear more about her experience as a mom. But I honestly hope she doesn't show her baby or at least not routinely like I hope it's more just like pictures or one-offs because I just don't think it's safe or fair so and I don't know I trust her she's another one that I have a hard time being distant from but I trust her judgment so I hope she doesn't go down that path okay so now that we've done like a full half hour of, of Carmageddon accidentally um, after talking about the pure wholesome content you came here for, which was e-reading. Um, I guess we'll start to wrap up because I'm, my voice is getting tired here. Oh yeah. I love, I cried so hard at her recent video. I was literally sitting there like trying to get some work done and crying, watching her and Zach find out about the baby. It was so sweet. Yeah. Trisha Paytas is really... Well, then she's trying to divert from Shane by exposing all this stuff about the vlog squad, which is also awful. So like <sighs> Carmageddon, Carmageddon really is a good, a good name for it. Cause I feel like all this horrible behavior is coming out. I don't know. You know, I, here's the thing, I guess where I'll leave is that human beings are messy and complicated and are not wholly consistent and don't always do the right thing and don't always act in accordance with their values. Like it is, you know, that is just the human experience. Like that is part of being a person. And I think having space for other people to be messy is an important part of having a functioning society so I do think it is hard to balance, like, acknowledging that and also holding people accountable. But I do think there comes a point where you have a certain amount of influence and you have a certain level of a pattern where you can't just, like, let it slide anymore. And I guess that's kind of where I'm at right now. Thank you. I'm trying to get better. I was, I, I'm trying to improve on comment curation here. Yes, the drama is real. Oh my gosh, yes, the Stofers. That was awful. That poor little boy. Ugh. Yeah. I guess if nothing else, YouTube can help us remember that uh, at the end of the day, humans are just garbage trash like we all... <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I guess we should, I should not judge our entire species by the worst of us, but um, I think we make a mistake if we only judge ourselves by the best of us too. So <sighs> again, trying to find that balance. Okay. Thank you guys for letting me process my thoughts on the drama because I have, you know, it's been a lot going on. Um, I appreciate you guys hanging out. Thank you, Zoe. Um, Let's see. Really love these live streams. Thank you. And like I mentioned, next week, um, live is going to be at 12 p.m. Central, not 8 p.m. Central, so that EU people can join live for once. And I'm sorry about that. So for, I'm sorry that normally they can't join. So next week, since I'm able to do it in the middle of the day, I'm going to do it in the middle of the day. So um, 
Oh, thank you so much. That's so kind. Um, thank you, Kay. Oh, I feel you, Zoe. I'm alone, too. Me and my kitty cats. So, thank you, guys. Oh, welcome, Lucy. I'm glad, I'm glad we, uh, well, I don't want to say that. I was about to say what we usually talk about with first times. I'm glad that you, we got to help you dip your toes in. How about that? Um, yes. Yeah, it does help to go live and chat a little bit. Oh, bless you, Ashley. Good luck. Yes, I'm, I'm also a petty queen, so I'm, I'm here for the drama. Okay, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful night. Stay safe, be well, and we will talk again next week. Bye.